Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome president of the Ford Foundation, Darren Walker. And the anchor for WDIV TV4, Devin Skillion. We count our chairs and we're in the right ones. Exactly. Let everybody kind of resettle a little bit. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very, I'm tickled that I found out this was my assignment. I was so happy to be here with you, Darren. Uh, before we get into the myriad of questions that I have, uh, right as we're speaking, unless I'm missing my guess, let me just double check, but it would appear that President Trump is pulling the United States out of the Paris Accord on climate change. Uh, we will join uh, Nicaragua and Syria as the only countries in the world who are not signatories to it. Syria, perhaps for obvious reasons. Oddly enough, Nicaragua didn't sign on because they didn't feel it was tough enough. Um, but it has been said many times that the ramifications of climate change will fall mostly on the least of us. So I know this is something you've thought about a lot and looked into a lot, and I'm curious about your reaction to what, what's happening right now in Washington. Well, I think it would be most unfortunate because the people who are most vulnerable to climate change are the people who are often left behind and left out. So wherever you are in the world, if you are poor, you live in what is often the most vulnerable landscape and geography uh, without the resources for resilience, for mitigation. So I think it would be really quite unfortunate. Sounds, sounds like that is what's, uh, what's happening at the moment. At least the Associated Press, the New York Times, a couple of others are reporting that that's the announcement that's coming here as we speak. Um, I, I don't want to bury the lead. I've got a lot of things I want to ask you, but I think uh, the news that broke this week uh, that, uh, of course, for a couple of years now, the Ford Foundation's been more and more involved in Detroit, but you're actually yeah. putting a physical presence, uh, a, a, a full-time Ford Foundation uh, staff member who is going to be uh, headquartered, living in Detroit. It's a former Detroiter, it turns out. But tell me about uh, this decision. Well, first of all, I think it's important to remember, I mean, the Ford Foundation started in Detroit. <laughs> um, and so while we have been independent of the Ford Motor Company and the Ford family for decades now, um, I think it's fair to say that certainly during my time as president, we uh, have built on, I think, decades of investment in Detroit the grand bargain provided us an opportunity to really, uh, I think, to, to in a more concentrated way, invest in the city's recovery. Uh, but as a national foundation, one of the disadvantages that we face is that when we work in a place, whether it be New Orleans or Oakland or Detroit, without having staff here, um, it, I don't believe, is as effective a strategy as it could be. So. To my mind, this is a natural extension of our uh, commitment to Detroit and to the region. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's no secret that the history of the Ford Foundation is a challenging history uh, yeah. when it relates to this city, to the Ford family, to the Ford Motor Company. I don't want to dig up too many bones on this, but I would like your thought on that. Um, you go back to the early 70s, if I, uh, to paraphrase, Henry Ford II said something along the lines of, this foundation has forgotten where its money came from and I will never forgive them for that. And it kind of went downhill from there uh, for a while. Um, can, you, can you sort of characterize that estrangement and why it was over 50 years, really, of, of disconnectedness? Well, I think Henry quite publicly when he resigned from the board in 1976, said that he was leaving in part because he felt the foundation had become, in many ways, uh, a caricature of, of East Coast liberalism, of the kinds of arrogance. Uh, he said that he personally was made to feel uh, like a country bumpkin by these Ivy League East Coast snobs who were running the Ford Foundation. I mean, these were his words. Uh, I think it was a very uh, contentious time. I mean, Henry Ford II was a remarkable man, but uh, like most remarkable, extraordinary people, he was quite complicated. And there were things that the foundation did that he fundamentally disagreed with. Uh, I mean, we were the single 
largest funder of the civil rights movement, which he supported. But the civil rights movement was very problematic for the Ford Motor Company because the dealers in the South were themselves boycotted by Southern consumers who identified Ford Motor Company with Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and all the things we were supporting, yeah. which caused huge problems for Henry. The other thing he didn't like was, was that we so aggressively supported the women's rights movement. I mean, we gave Gloria Steinem our first grant. We supported the creation of the Ms. Foundation. Mm -hmm. Henry very publicly said, as long as he was chairman of the Ford Motor Company and the Ford Foundation, there would never be a woman on the board of either. Yeah. Um, and he was, he was successful at keeping that pledge at the Ford Motor Company. At the Ford Foundation, however, the president, McGeorge Bundy, basically did an end run on him and, and got the other trustees to agree in 1972 to elect the first woman and a second woman in 1975. And um, the correspondence during this period is quite fascinating. Um, <laughs> and uh, he, he uh, was not happy. And so by 1976, um, there were just a number of things we were doing. But I should say that Henry was right on several fronts. He was right about the arrogance. He was right that we were spending money too fast mm -hmm. uh, and, that we were, and that the leadership was not stewarding the resources uh, prudently. Um, he was right about the attitude uh, of many people at the foundation at the time. You know, if, it, if it's not our idea, if it wasn't sort of built here, then it's not worth yeah, investing yeah, in. Yeah. What has it been like for you then personally as you have reconnected with the Ford family? Well, it's been amazing because the Ford family is an amazing family. I mean, yeah. remember, I, I came to the, to the Ford Foundation from the Rockefeller Foundation. Right. So it was a very different context at Rockefeller. You keep interesting company, by the well, way. Well, you know, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's very interesting and, and yeah. a real contrast because the Rockefeller family, while Rockefeller Foundation remained independent, always had one Rockefeller on the board, and there was always a connection between the family, the legacy of John D., and what the foundation did today. I mean, even during orientation at Rockefeller, you know, you get the little booklet on the family, and you'd learn, you know, you, you get these documents from the archives of John D. Rockefeller's writings. You know, at Ford, it was, you know, just the no name one really on the, talked about just the, the name on the I mean, door. I mean, yeah. I mean, there, yeah. I mean, the, 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 there wasn't really much discussion about the Ford. So I will say, the the first thing that Bill Ford did when I became president, he was speaking on um, on NPR about uh, the foundation and um, the unfortunate history, and he said that it was really quite regrettable. I reached out to him, and he immediately called me back. We had lunch. Um, he introduced me to his amazing mother, who is a force. Uh, <laughs> and I have just come to hugely ad admire Martha uh, Ford. She's just uh, an extraordinary woman. And the family um, are just people deeply committed to this city and deeply committed to philanthropy. There's been uh, an awful lot said, written, talked about the grand bargain. I'd like to revisit it for just a, a moment because to me it's still uh, maybe we've uh, lost touch with what an elegant piece of problem solving it was. But I'm also struck every time I think about it at the amazing fortune that the city had in the personalities that were involved and around it at that time. Uh, you know, the stars just kind of seemed to align that you were where you were, that we had a Republican governor who was willing to go to the rest of the state and say, you have to support Detroit. Uh, that the art became so important to people. To, I mean, there's just a lot of different pieces of this. But as you look back at it now, um, what are your reflections on it? Well, I think everyone, uh, everyone did what was needed to get done the job at hand. And so the Surprising how often, though, that doesn't happen. Well, I mean, the one thing I will say about the foundations, because in Detroit, when you have foundations like Kresge and Rip Rapson, yeah, yeah. and just start there and go down the list, 
yeah, Marion. I mean, I just go down the list of all my yeah, colleagues yeah, yeah, who are just yeah. amazing doing work here Marianne at Nolan, Philanthropy. Yeah. Um, and a governor who, who in many ways, some would say cynically, it was not in his political interest to be an advocate for Detroit and Lansing. Yeah. And he, it could not have gotten done without Governor Snyder. And he was deeply committed uh, to, to supporting this. Um, and the DIA, I mean, everybody, everybody stepped up. And so, it, you know, and ultimately the retirees, I mean, the retirees were the real heroes of the story, mm -hmm. in my view, mm -hmm. because they were the people, I mean, you know, we just wrote a check. I mean, I didn't give up anything personally. <laughs> they gave up something personally to save their city. Yeah. And so I just think what they did was just quite remarkable. Yeah. It's also interesting that when it all started, you had a lot of retirees who were um, furious that they felt that art was going to be prized over their lives and over their livelihood. In the end, once it looked like the art might be taken away, a lot of people rushed in to save that art, which in turn then saved the pensions. I, I don't want to oversimplify it, but Detroit was in many ways the city that was saved by art. Well, there's no doubt that without the collection, the, uh, the anchor for, uh, for raising the money, I mean, the DIA itself, remember, raised it, it, 100 yeah, oh, yeah. million dollars, yes, which yes. was essential yeah. to solving the problem. So, I mean, the great thing about this city that I am constantly reminded of is the legacy of this city is all about excellence. I mean, yeah. the fact that this museum is a world-class museum, which many people in Detroit don't, I mean, <laughs> I've seen almost every great museum in the world, I mean, and, and certainly in the United States. And, you know, the DIA is literally among the top five, I mean, hands down. Yeah. No, I mean, it's an amazing museum. It really is. And I don't say that to say, I mean, I think about, you know, my, I love being in the Rivera Court, and it's amazing because Edsel was clearly such a visionary right. and yeah. Yeah. clearly took risks. I mean, it didn't portray his father in the most lovingly way. Right, right. And, 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 you know, his friend, Nelson Rockefeller, commissioned for, for Rockefeller Center, Diego Rivera, to do murals as well. Right, right. And, of course, Rivera produced something similar, mm -hmm. and John D. Rockefeller was also not portrayed lovingly. <laughs> um, and, and he had them immediately destroyed. Yeah. And so when I walk into Rockefeller Center and I think about what, what, what would have been there had Nelson Rockefeller been as courageous as Edsel Ford was, what a loss for New York. What a loss for New York because when you go into Rockefeller Center today, I mean, it's an interesting sort of art deco whatever. But I mean, it's, it's, it's <laughs> not, I mean, it, it, is, it does not captivate you yeah. the way yeah. The destroyed industry murals just completely, I mean, I could sit there all day long. And for you to feel the connectivity to completely. it now to what you do is completely. really extraordinary. Yeah. Well, let's move on then to your plans and, and, and what you want to do in Detroit. I, um, I, I guess one of the first, I've, I've talked to a number of people from other foundations who are both excited and yet a little, I think nervous might be the right word. Um, because the Ford Foundation is breathtakingly, in fact, that's the exact right word, because I think some people fear there might not be enough oxygen in the room for so many, you know, for everyone then to be, uh, to be a part of it. And I think some are wondering already, are you planning on um, uh, working with other foundations, being a partner with other foundations, or have you found over the years that it's better to go it alone so that you don't risk moving at the speed of the slowest ship? We can't get accomplished what we want to get accomplished of working alone. I mean, it is uh, impossible to do the work we do uh, in isolation from the larger ecosystem of philanthropy and social change. So 
first of all, we are co-locating our office with the Kellogg Foundation. So mm -hmm. we work with Kellogg, we work with Kresge, we work with Knight, all the foundations here, Wilson. I mean, we work on different levers with all of them and we will only be as successful as we are willing to be collaborative. Yeah. So I am um, convinced that the only way we're gonna get things done is, is in partnership. And the other reality is that, and it's why we've, we are doing the mission-related investment work, which really follows on Kresge because they were the pioneer in this area. 5% mm -hmm. grant making, we can't solve the problems we wanna solve with grant making. Right? We, I mean, the problems that we want to solve are, and we need to solve are so large uh, that we've got to use all the tools that we have at our disposal. So we have a $12.5 billion endowment, and to not look at that as an asset to be deployed for both financial and social return in my view, is an abdication of our responsibility. I'm curious about how you measure return. When, you're, when your mission is social justice, it's, uh, it's a funny thing to try and create a measurable on that. If I, if I create a foundation that wants to plant trees, every year I can count the trees that I've planted. How do you measure social justice and whether what you've, uh, the seeds that you've spread, whether they're bearing fruit or not? Well, I think the idea today, sadly, of justice is contested in our culture. <laughs> well, as a friend of mine used to say, to some people, justice means just us. Well, and it, it's <laughs> right. It means just us, or it means that our normative hierarchies of, of our culture and who is at the top and who is at the bottom is disrupted by the idea of justice. Yeah. Because in fact, it is yeah. to be disrupted. And so when we think about how do we disrupt, uh, there are certainly ways in which you can do initiatives, interventions that randomized controlled trials can uh, produce results and produce metrics. Mm. There are other things that, I mean, how do we measure racial progress? What's the metric? And in a democracy, you never take justice and progress for granted, as we know yeah. today. Yeah. And so we can, it's why we focus on what I call the three I's, institutions, ideas, and individuals. Because the institutions that today are on the front lines, so let's just take anything, voting rights. So the Ford Foundation was deeply engaged in the 60s around what was going on in the South, all of the voter suppression of African Americans in the South. Uh, through activism, through leadership, through investing in people, real change was made. Mm -hmm. We got the Voting Rights Act, policy change, practice changed. All right, 50 years later, we get the Shelby decision, which basically says, we're back at square one. Yeah. And so, and a series of laws that even the Fifth Circuit, the conservative Fifth Circuit said in Texas were, were crafted to suppress the votes of Hispanics and blacks in Texas. So the voter ID laws, the, the new legal restrictions on voting were propagated with that purpose in mind. And so we today are supporting organizations, the various legal defense funds, the ACLU, other organizations that are continuing to do what you have to do when you live in a democracy. Never take it for granted because progress is followed often by regress. And so it's, it's why you can never say, what's the randomized control trial metric that's gonna tell us that we've succeeded? Because on any given day, it could look like success, and a couple of years later, it can look like failure. Which makes, uh, uh, I guess, uh, is there such a thing as a measurable then to you, or do you just have to sort of develop a general sense of the way things feel the way No, I think I think you measure. So in the in this case what you measure are the institutions whose 
mission it is to protect and promote democratic practice. Because you, you know that democracy ebbs and flows. I mean, the, the, the ways in which people engage, the ways in which progress is made is often followed by regress, is often followed by backlash. And so, you know, I think for many people, including myself, one could have naively thought that the election of Barack Obama would unleash a much greater sense of racial harmony when in fact it unleashed it exposed. and exposed a vicious racism and a response from some sectors of our society that were simply appalled by the notion that a black man could be president of the United States. And so this is what happens in a democracy. And, and so how do, what are the institutions that need to be resilient and fortified for the fight for justice over generations? You measure how well they're doing. Yeah. And sure, you measure on any given day, you know, programmatically what a three-year sort of set of deliverables are. But do you really, I mean, we made our first grant in 1953 in South Africa on, on apartheid. So we could have, so a fair amount. we could, and we made grants for 40 years. I mean, Nelson Mandela did yeah. not get out of prison for 40 years. On any given day in that 40 year strand, a strand of strategy with the United States government basically critiquing the Ford Foundation and what we were doing, yeah. uh, obviously uh, uh, many people not believing that, that uh, supporting campus movements uh, to raise awareness about apartheid was a good use of grant making money. <laughs> we believed it was. And, and, and the reason was because it was the right thing to do. And the metrics for measuring that were not uh, quantifiable by any sort of a, a gold standard uh, metricable yeah. way. Uh, another way of talking about this then is what have you decided does not work? What is the, not the best use of your resources? Yeah. What doesn't work is top-down initiatives designed by experts sitting in an office in Manhattan. <laughs> um, we know that doesn't work. Uh, we, have, we have spent a lot of money to learn that. And, um, and I think we're not alone. So has the World Bank. So has the IMF. So has so have the Swedes. I mean, you could just go around the world. Um, and, and so what works is when you don't privilege credentialed knowledge over authentic lived experience of people, folk on the ground, giving you their perspective on what they need, yeah. rather than a group of experts with PhDs determining what they need. Yeah. You, you must obsess, though, over um, the things that you don't do sometimes. Rather, I, I, sort of famously, uh, the Ford Foundation passed on giving a grant to Maya Angelou because she didn't feel very talented. Yes. <laughs> like, I mean, so, Matt Bundy sent her a letter basically saying, you have no talent, black lady. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was like an amazing letter. I mean, there, there was so much good stuff in the Ford archives. I mean, there was a time, I mean, you look at some of these, the, some of the correspondence and you really can't believe it. I mean, that there was a time where, where people people, white men would write letters to people <laughs> saying, you do this, African leader. Here's what, here are the three things I want you to do to fix your economy, and here's $50 million, go do it. And by the way, we're sending over to help you, you know, mm. an economist from Berkeley, an economist from Michigan, an economist from Harvard, and that's what you're going to do. Mm. And, or a letter to Maya Angelou, Maya Angelou. And saying, you have no talent. <laughs> We're quite, we were, I mean, there are lots of, 
you, that it was like you, that. It wouldn't be the same that. without those kind of war oh, stories, absolutely. though, that's for sure. Uh, but as you, uh, and this takes us back a little bit to sort of what's going on in Washington, I guess. What is our national reputation, our national outlook at any given, which of course has an ebb and flow in the White House all the time, how does that impact the way that the rest of the world sees you, or do you get to stand apart from that? No, I mean, I think we have, uh, I mean, the, when the Ford Foundation, when Henry moved the Ford Foundation to New York and the company went public and we overnight became yeah. such a wealthy institution, the, the Which is an amazing story as to how that came story. about. It is an amazing he, for those story. who don't know, he couldn't leave these uh, shares to his children because they would have never been able to afford the taxes. So instead, he endowed the foundation with that inheritance. Is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah, I mean, I think when Edsel died, unexpe I mean, Edsel died at 49 in mm -hmm. 1943 of, of, of cancer, and it was totally unexpected. The company was still privately held, and that was during the notorious Roosevelt 70% uh, estate tax period. And so the tax on the family, on Edsel's estate, uh, would have required them to basically liquidate yeah. a huge amount of Ford Motor Company stock. Yeah. Sorry uh, for that aside. No, so you, and it's an important, it's a really interesting story. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, it's a fascinating <laughs> story. But when we started in the 50s, our work was completely aligned with the State Department. I mean, there's a reason India was our first office, our first international office, because India was what the United States government was obsessing about, uh, not being, becoming communist. communist yeah. As wow. the British were leaving, I mean, the whole issue of India being a democracy and a capitalist democracy uh, was very important. So we were very much aligned um, with the US government. And, and today, I think the real challenge is we have made assumptions about foreign assistance, about diplomacy, about soft power that may not actually be the philosophy of the United States government going forward. Mm -hmm. So the implications for our work, I mean, I mean, you know, I was sitting I won't, with a minister in a in a foreign country uh, where we have an office and in you know where we support human rights and. And he said, basically, you know, you Americans can't come here and lecture us about human rights anymore. Are you kidding me? Look at your own country. Um, you know, you don't have the credibility that you used to have on these issues. And, um, and that's very worrisome. And it makes it really hard if you're trying to do human rights work in other parts of the country, uh, other parts of the world. And these foreign leaders, they watch American TV. I mean, they know what's going on in Ferguson and in Baltimore and in these various places in the world. Yeah. Uh, back to Detroit then. So Kevin Ryan come, is the, the, yeah. the, the man who's coming in, a, a native Detroiter who's coming yes. back now to, to be your point person there. I guess I, I, it's too early to ask you to sort of spitball how you expect, you've already committed, I think it's $15 million oh, yeah. a year, more than any other single city. Um, uh, if you were just to sort of guess and venture at what the kinds of things, the first five investments that you could see the Ford Foundation um, making as its formal entree now into Detroit, can, can you sort of? Well, I mean, I think we have a portfolio. If you go on our website now and mm -hmm. come to Detroit, there's a lot of grants. I mean, th th we're going to continue to do that kind of work and the cultural sphere, uh, housing and, and community development, a huge issue for us, uh, the issue of blight. Um, the issue of jobs and small businesses. Uh, I think we're very concerned about um, helping uh, uh, renew the civic spirit and support uh, civic organizations. Um, that's very, very important. I mean, I will say that it is quite encouraging uh, to see how much progress the city has made in these last few years. Uh, it is. Uh, really, the, 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 the narrative about Detroit has moved from a deficit narrative, a problem city, to an opportunity narrative. Yeah. And so it is, it is totally, I mean, it's so interesting. Even the media, I mean, you see, I mean, what you used to see about Detroit in the media was just, <laughs> just dispiriting. I mean, as, a, as an outsider to read what you read, a decade ago, uh, pretty bleak. was was pretty bleak, pretty dismal. Well, you you know, 
What you read today, I mean, I opened the New York Times last week and there was 36 hours in Detroit. Um, you know, I was flipping through Town and Country Magazine or something and it's like all these great cultural institutions on Woodward Avenue. You know, I was looking in the real estate journal and it was all about what was happening um, in Detroit in terms of real estate. So, you know, Detroit is, has always, but I think it will continue to capture the imagination of the country. The issue for Detroit and the issue for our country today is, is the scourge of inequality. I mean, we have this huge challenge in this country of growing inequality, which is why this yeah. is what we've, yeah. I think, doubled down in, in terms of our own mission. Because one of the things Henry put in the mission of the Ford Foundation was to advance democratic practice, to strengthen democracies around the world. Yeah, yeah. And because he believed that that there was no better form of organizing a society than a democracy. And he was right. Mm -hmm. The challenge is, in a democracy, it is, it is, it is very important uh, in a place like the United States where at the core of our narrative is, is opportunity. And when people don't feel that there is opportunity, they become hopeless. And I absolutely, truly believe that the greatest threat to our democracy is not terrorism or a pandemic or climate change. It's hopelessness. Because hopelessness will, hopelessness will drive a people to do desperate things. And they do desperate things because they are angry, because they feel unheard, they feel overlooked. And so when we think about how we, I mean, we have to have hope because in so many ways, uh, hope gives democracy the oxygen it needs, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we, it, 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 it is how we breathe. And if there's not hope, a democracy doesn't breathe. Yeah. It becomes asphyxiated by its own internal systems and cultures. And I think that's the risk to our democracy. Which might take us well into the last thing that I wanted to make sure we talked about, and that is a little bit of the encroachment of technology. Uh, it has enriched our lives in so many ways, and yet it's also leaving many people behind. Uh, Michigan has lost a lot of jobs to robots. Uh, technology keeps making our life better, even as at the other end, it's taking away. And uh, the, the hopelessness, I, I, I think, that you speak of is, is a problem there, as we really get a little too smart sometimes for our own good. And that's a ju social justice issue too, isn't it? it is. No, it's a, it's a huge social justice issue, and the challenge around uh, it, the fallacy that you know we are going to return to the golden days of manufacturing, which is just that. I mean, it is. We would love for that to happen, but it is not going to happen. I mean, it is not. And and there are ways in which we can have a manufacturing economy, but it won't be what it once was. And and therefore, it's incumbent upon us to figure a way forward that isn't these sort of oppositional ideas of what the future is, right? So on the one hand, it is, it is folks in Silicon Valley saying basically technology is good, and if, it, and if you're a loser in this new fourth industrial revolution, there's gonna be universal basic income. We've got a solution for that. It's called UBI, universal basic income. And on the other, other hand, you know, people who, who just say we shouldn't have technological advancement because it's bad for us. Um, and so we have these oppositional notions of what our uh, economy ought to be constructed to, to do and look like. And, and neither is right. There's got to be in the middle or there's some in that continuum of a future where people have work because you know, again, I've been in a lot of places in the world. There is no country 
on the planet where work is so central to a person's identity than the United States. And so to... <laughs> is that good or bad? I mean, I think it's good. I mean, I think it's good in the, in the sense that people want to feel that they are contributing to something important and something larger than yeah. themselves. Yeah. And so work provides that. It provides dignity. Because ultimately, justice is about dignity. I mean, the, the reason people are angry is because so many people are living without dignity. And it's why when those of us who live with dignity and live with privilege and have enormous privilege like I do, say, well, why is this person? I mean, I, I remember the first time I went to India and, and I, to, to where Ford has an office and, you know, in some areas, you know, people defecating in the streets. And to an American sensibility, yeah. I mean, that is, I mean, I mean, do you know, I mean, but, <laughs> but if you live in a society where you are a Dalit, you are at the bottom of the rung of caste and people don't give you a monicum of, of dignity in the way they treat you, the way they engage with you, why wouldn't you defecate in the streets? What do you have to lose? What standards are you seeking to hold up? Because yeah. the society has rendered you useless and invisible. And that's an extreme, obviously, but, because but, we're not going to see this happening in the United States, I want to be clear. But it is an extreme of what happens. We're coming to you from a place where there's a lot of stuff in the streets here on the island, but well, you know, no, I know what you mean. <laughs> uh, but but, but it, it, is, it is what happens when people, when a society becomes so unjust that people live without dignity. It translates to so many other levels beyond uh, your bathroom habits. I, I, absolutely. Dignity, I, absolutely. And, and I, this is an unfair thing to ask you with only about a minute left. But then this, to me, is one of the central conundrums for foundations and groups that are trying to create social justice. And that's the difference between, uh, you hear it all the time, hand out and hand up. And, and dignity is more, much more intrinsic in a hand up. It is, but it's also, it, 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 you can't project your way out of this. And this is the, and, and it's one of the issues that, you know, at the foundation we debate a lot because we focus on systems. Yeah. And yeah. for a lot of people, systems are just not the thing you want to be engaged in yeah. because they're big quagmires and they're really, but, but systems are the way you, you affect change at large scale. I was in the first class of Head Start in 1965. That was a system. It is a, Head Start is a system. And it was a systemic approach that built on a set of demonstrations that the Ford Foundation funded at Yale and New Haven. But ultimately, it was a systemic response to the issue of early childhood advancement and achievement for low-income yeah, kids like yeah, me. Yeah. And so you've got to focus on those systems. We can't say in New York City where we have this huge challenge or in Los Angeles around homelessness, yeah. that, we, that, that we can build enough homeless shelters to fix this. There is a systemic problem with our housing system that produces so little housing for poor people and for people with mental health issues that they're in the streets. That's the root cause. And so when philanthropists say, oh, I'll go and build a homeless shelter. Yes, we need that homeless shelter, but that's not gonna fix the problem. Yeah. What's gonna fix the problem is a systemic response that has a policy, again, lots of foundations and philanthropists don't wanna go there, that has a policy response and intervention that can be sustained, not just a wonderful three-year project, yeah. but that can be sustained. It's been a, I, I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours, no doubt about it. They won't let me do that. Um, it's funny, when I saw that headline in uh, the New York Times that said 36 hours in Detroit, uh, I, I thought, you know, the old answer would be, what is waiting on a bus, Alex? But, uh, <laughs> That's true. but it I is mean, not, about I know. Six hours in Detroit 10 years ago, it is, that headline would have been about guns, about, you know, strife, about burned out bills. I mean, it would have been a completely different story. And the fact that it is a completely 
a different story today. You have had a huge hand in that, and I'm so grateful that uh, you and the Ford Foundation are there starting June 12th is when that office opens. The Ford Foundation, Darren Walker, ladies Thank and gentlemen. You. Thank you, Darren.